I've got a very exciting announcement for you. That is the Healing Power of Energy Retreat held at Cuixmala in Mexico is on for January 30th through February 6th, 2021. It's a seven-night transformative retreat fusing ancient healing wisdom with advanced modern technology. It'll be led by Dr. Rashid Buttar, Dr. Jerry Rivera DiGenio, and Robert Slovak. And I'll be there live streaming, recording, covering the whole thing. I look forward to you joining me. If you want to get more information, get your tickets, go to lukestory.com slash events. That's lukestory.com slash events for the healing power of energy treat at Cuixmala in Mexico. I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Welcome to a special bonus rebroadcast episode of my recent appearance on The Chris Dufay Show. We discuss my former life as a hopeless drug addict and all the tools I applied over the past 23 years to transform a life of suffering and failure into a life of joy and success. This Tuesday, we'll be back with our regular programming featuring Ben Greenfield, The Path of Faith, Finding Meaning with Meditation, Prayer, and Plant Medicine. If you want to learn all about the EMF in your life, the electromagnetic frequencies emitting from your computer, tablet, phone, Wi-Fi router, nearby cell towers, smart meters, etc., I highly encourage you to join my brand new EMF Home Safety Masterclass. It's over five hours of content for only $149. So if you want to learn how to discover and fix the EMF in your life, go to lukestory.com slash EMF masterclass. That's lukestory.com slash EMF masterclass, where you can learn everything you know about the EMF and how to fix it. Okay, now enjoy this bonus rebroadcast show, and I'll be back at you on Tuesday with Ben Greenfield. How does a stylist come to doing what you do today? That's a good question. So now I have this podcast called The Lifestylist. I do consultations with people. I I still don't have a name for what I do. I change it every week right now. I think my latest is a lifestyle design architect. Just like sort of creating a framework for someone's life and then implementing different practices and principles and Uh, Just lifestyle choices that help someone build a really fulfilling, healthy, energetic, sustainable life. And so uh, the reason that it sort of relates to what I used to do is as a fashion stylist and those listening that are watching that don't know what that means. It's a fashion stylist is someone who goes out and shops for clothes and dresses models and celebrities and things like that. So I did that for 17 years and it's very similar in what I do now. I'm just doing it on a metaphysical level. Uh, with spiritual ideas and practices, meditation, breath work, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then also with the different health practices and and regimens that I found to be useful. And how I made the transition was really, um, I was a stylist for 17 years and that was great. It was a great career. I was successful and, uh, you know, it was fine. (laughs) I I think after I got out of it, I was like, how did I do that for 17 years? Because it's intense and it's, it's stressful for a number of reasons. But for the for 21 years now, and, and all 17 years that I was a stylist, when I was not at work, I was running off to hot springs and doing acupuncture and doing juice fast and making kombucha and infrared saunas and going to India to learn to meditate and doing every form of yoga and a lot of that stuff just in my private life. And my friends knew that I was into it, but I was kind of a lone wolf in terms of all of the sort of extreme self-care that I was into because I was on a mission to better myself and to, um, in the beginning to just stay sober. You know, I've been sober for 21 years. I was a horribly addicted kid and adolescent and, uh, and young adult and really struggled a lot with mental and emotional issues, mental health issues, all that. And, uh, you know, I was on medication and in a million kinds of therapy and just really struggled for the first part of my life. And then when I was 26, that's when I get, got sober and got into all of this stuff. So it was at first just like a desperate self-preservation lifestyle. Wow. Yes. But then as I moved out of the desperation phase, I actually just became really happy and healthy and I liked it. So I kept going with that. But I 
never knew that there was any chance that I could turn kind of my hobbies into a career or a brand. Yep. You know, now I guess I'm like a brand, which is funny. Yeah. But uh, what happened was two years ago, I went and spoke in an event. And uh, just on a whim, a friend of mine who's an author named Neil Strauss, he has this awesome. yeah, men's group. Yeah. yeah. And so, so I was, I was once a member of his mastermind and intensive group. It's called the society and it's a men's group, mm-hmm. a bunch of entrepreneurs and just people into personal development and stuff. And so he was putting together one of his intensives and they each have a focus. And this one was on health and biohacking. And I got wind of that. And I think he reached out, you know, hey, who would be a good guest, you know, have speakers. And so I connected him with some of the top players because those are all my heroes and in the field of health and biohacking. And I've, I've known some of those people and stuff just socially. And so I kind of I'm a good connector and I'm, yep. I'm like a professional Cupid <laughs> kind of see how people can support one another. And so as I was helping him sort of curate the speakers, I was really afraid to do this because I just was so I, had, I lacked confidence in this area. I've done a lot of public speaking in, uh, in other realms, but not in terms of, you know, health and being an expert there. But anyway, I think I texted Neil or emailed him was like, Hey, no pressure. Like I'm not, I don't want to cross the friend boundary here. Please feel free to say no. It's, it's totally cool. Yeah. But I know a lot about this stuff. And I'd be really stoked if I could come sneak in a little talk for the guys. Yeah. Because a lot of the guys I knew from when I was a, a member of the group. And he was like, yeah, great, perfect. We'll put you on right before David Wolf. The opening night. Wow. You know? I, was like, <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, what have I got myself into? You know? I mean, I was following that guy's work for years. And he's such a charismatic public speaker and, you know, just speaks to thousands. I mean, he's spoken. When I interviewed him the other day, David Wolf. And he's like, yeah, I've spoken um, at 3,000 events over the course wow. of the past. 30 years or something, you know, I mean, he spoke to, I don't know how many thousands of people that is. So Neil was like, yeah, cool. You'll just be with him. I was like, oh my God. But I put together a presentation and uh, I went and did it with a number of other people that I really admired on stage and stuff. And it was really well received. And afterward, a couple of the big players pulled me aside and they said, dude, you're really good at this. You really know your shit. Do you are you aware of the fact that you could totally be doing what we're all doing? You could be one of us, not the guy in the audience, basically. And I was like, what? Totally revolutionary idea. And it was fortunately and unfortunately an idea that I couldn't get out of my head. You know, I went home and I was like, ah, they're just being nice. And I tried to dismiss it, but that thought just kept coming back. Like, wow, maybe they're right. Maybe I could do something here that would be, you know, meaningful to me because this is where my true passion lies. And maybe I could really help people. Because I also own a fashion school, the yes. School of Style. It's where I just came from before you arrived. Yep. And we've trained, um, I guess the number 3,000 is probably, but we've trained over 3,000 people uh, to be a fashion stylist in the course of the past 10 years. So I've helped a lot of people in that, but that's not really, you know, fashion isn't, and Hollywood and all that stuff isn't really where my passion is. So that seed got planted by those guys. And um, long story short, after a few months, I finally just kind of settled on the idea that if I was going to create content, that a podcast would be the way to do it. Right. So we start, were you listening to podcasts at the time? Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, that's why I chose that medium yes. um, because I knew that I could be most consistent with that. I love talking. I love getting to know people. I love interviewing people. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, I'm an avid learner. I constantly listen to, I mean, literally every day I listen to, I mean, probably two podcasts a day, yeah, yeah. you know, if not more. I fall asleep to them every night. Right when I wake up, I'm like, podcast. <laughs> it started, actually, you know, it's the audio thing for me, the audio learning um, started for me because I hated school. Just the, the U.S. school system was just antithetical to my whole learning style and personality. I hated school from the first day in kindergarten. I was kicked out of first grade. I mean, I was just. I'm not, I mean, they're, they're like, you got to go. <laughs> Mom, take your kid. Luke's out of here. Yeah. You know, I was beating kids up in first grade. I mean, it was just a disaster in school. And then later I was getting beat up. You know, the tables always turn. <laughs> um, but I really started learning uh, on these old cassette, these big booklets of like personal development and yeah. spiritual cassette booklets. You that. know, they were yeah. in like a big binder, totally. you know. And I'd listen to those cassette series, um, Wayne Dyer and mm-hmm. Stuart Wilde and... Uh, Brian Tracy, a lot of the personal development, and even some of the marketing and sales guys, you know, Zig Ziglar, just yeah. all of that stuff from probably stuff that came out in the 80s and early 90s. And then they turned to CD sets. Yep. The big booklets yep. had CDs now, which was revolutionary. And then the MP3 thing happened. Yep. And you could like 
buy someone's, you know, a batch of MP3s and someone or their audiobooks. And I would drive around. And so much, especially of my spiritual growth and understanding came as a result of just repeatedly listening to those programs and those, you know, those um, public talks that had been recorded or yeah. audio books, like The Power of Now. I mean, I've probably yeah. listened to that. Dude, I've listened to it hundreds of times over the course of, you know, however many years I got it right when I came out, read it, and then started listening to it. And also being a stylist, what you basically do is you drive around LA for 12 hours a day and it's boring as shit and stressful as shit. So in order to not get road rage, I would like listen to these spiritual <laughs> yeah. programs and they'd be talking about love talking. and peace and bliss and watch your ego and watch the mind. And that was like my, the first seed of my awakening was seeing that road rage. And I'd be about to throw something out of my car at someone or honk or yell or flip someone off. And then Eckhart Tolle would be like, imagine you're a butterfly. You know? <laughs> okay, okay, calm down. Yeah. That, was, that, was, that was really my first integration into That's spirituality. So anyway, I'm making a really long story out of a, a short one. That's but it. to answer more specifically, the transition yes. was, you know, I was really just feeling like I fulfilled my mission doing fashion. I was like, cool. I mean, I've dressed some of the biggest stars in the world. There's plenty more. I never got to Keith Richards. You know, that was my one like stretch goal. I never got to work with the stones, but I did work with a lot of great talented people and photographers and magazines and doing music videos and all this stuff. It was like, cool. I mean, I don't know what else there is to do here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I had the school that was supporting me. It was really successful and that was you know, paying the bills. So I thought, okay, I'll just do this podcast and see what happens. If it doesn't work, then whatever, I'll go back to being a stylist or go do whatever I'm meant to be doing if it's not that. And I started the podcast and all the people that I started approaching to be guests who were really big people in health and spirituality and stuff, everyone's like, yes, 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 yes. No one said no. Right. And I was just, I was actually shocked. I felt like I was tricking them. <laughs> I'm like, like a confirmation for you. Yeah, totally. And it just, it did a lot for my confidence. And then I got so much positive feedback. People was saying, wow, you're really good at this. And the way that you approach these, you know, the metaphysical and, and the physical yeah. is different than a lot of people are doing it because you're just very funny and real and relatable. Yeah. But sometimes I'm talking about deeply meaningful spiritual concepts and ideas and beliefs. But I guess I have a way of doing that. That's not too off putting to people that are afraid of the woo-woo. Why do you think that is? That I'm able to do it in a relatable yeah. way? I think it has, you know, I think it has a lot to do with, um, I think it has a lot to do with my recovery, yeah. you know, with my addiction recovery, because over the years, uh, really, I mean, the cornerstone of my ability to not be a heroin addict anymore and other things that I was doing that were illegal and dangerous and yeah. criminal and everything else, uh, in order to not do that, once you sort of get your own seatbelt on, you go around and you fasten other seatbelts. So service is a really big part of my life, not to be, not to grandstand that and, you know, show the world what a great guy I am, but it's, it's really, sure. a, it's an act of, you know, self, um, you know, preservation really to serve others and to help others. And what I've noticed is that um, there's a huge barrier to entry for people. I've mostly worked with men because, you know, obviously there could be a conflict of interest if you're trying to help you know, a woman yeah. get off drugs or something. So we tend to kind of stay with the genders. Yeah. Um, but I found that uh, because the most successful model for treating addiction is through spiritual practices mm -hmm. and that that's really difficult to get someone to go along with because of the defiance of their ego and, um, and the propensity for certain types of people to be very, intellectually driven and analytical and have a really hard time crossing the bridge to God. Yes. But God is the answer. So it's like, how do you convey to someone who doesn't want to be religious, doesn't really want to be spiritual, yeah. that God is in fact their salvation? So how do you find words for things like God and salvation, all those things? I, I love where you're going with this. Yeah. Like I grew up going to Catholic schools, primary school, um, high school, and doing the last day of church was the last day we were in school. And, not religious, but I remember listening to uh, Wayne Dyer and he said, just like, God is good. And when he said that, I, I got rid of that stigma that was behind those three letters being next to each other. Do you mean there's God and being able to be like, oh, okay, my world is growing and I'm definitely going through this journey of being able to understand it and where's my place and how do I join the rest of this world and everything the universe comes together. So when it comes to your addiction, your recovery, and now how you're able to help people go through those as well. 
what's your framework when it comes to understanding what yourself or this person, the subject that you're looking at, and what steps they need to take moving forward? It's funny you mentioned Wayne Dyer because I've never consciously had that thought, but he was also really good at that. Yeah. He was talking about... Because I think I've listened to The Power of Intention six, <laughs> seven, eight times. It's something yeah. that I like keep going yeah. back to as kind of like a, oops, kind of brings me back in line. Well, Wayne Dyer was bringing really powerful metaphysical and spiritual ideas to the masses. I mean, the guy was on like PBS shows and yeah. filling huge, you know, I don't know if they're arenas, but huge venues and stuff like that. And he was a very kind of common sort of guy. You know, he didn't use big fancy words and he wasn't coming out in an orange robe with beads. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's like just a normal dude. He's like your dad or something. You know? Yeah, very relatable. And when he talked, you're just like, oh shit, as much mm-hmm. as I don't want to like this guy, it actually mm-hmm. makes sense. Mm-hmm. You can't really refute basic fundamental truths. So I think in my approach to helping people acquire some of what I found is um, one thing is I'm just really passionate about it because I suffered so much, dude. I mean, life was not fun for me and everyone has their own story. And I'm sure there's people that have been through worse things than, than I, but my childhood was not pretty. It was rough. Dude. There was a lot of trauma, a lot of abuse. As I said, a lot of mental and emotional issues. I was just thinking about this over the weekend, actually, we um, I was with Neil again and his group. I went out and did a talk on fashion, ironically enough. But uh, I was sitting in on some of the exercises, and one of them was where you sort of um, you tell your your stories if you're pitching a movie or a book in eight minutes. And so I was watching all the guys, and as they were doing, of course, I'm like, oh, what's my story? And I didn't have a turn. But I was like, God, mine's pretty compelling, you know? Like sexual abuse at five years old, got into violence and vandalism and arson at six years old, pornography at seven years old, had my first drink at eight. You know I mean? Yeah. It's just hardcore. And then the story goes on and on and on. So I've just suffered so much that I'll do anything to help someone who's suffered in ways that I have, because I know that there's a solution. So I think my first method in getting through to someone is, and making it relatable is that I really believe in what I'm talking about because I'm not talking about a concept of being spiritual or surrender or having a relationship with God or with the divine. I'm talking from actually living in that experience. And so that's different than someone saying, Hey, here's what you need to do when they're not doing it. I mean, this is, this is me. And so the passion and I think the, um, the level of sincerity that I have and that um, I also have a very pure motive. I have no incentive to get someone to believe what I believe or practice the meditation I practice or do the yoga I do. It's live and let live. I really don't care. And if you want to leave here today and go smoke crack in your Uber on the way to your hotel, like I don't give a shit. It's none of my business, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So I'm not out crusading or proselytizing. However, if someone approaches me, whether it be engaging with my content or coaching or just anyone that I know on a personal level, like it's invitation only. In other words, I don't give anyone recommendations. And this took me years to get here too. I don't give recommendations. I see people eating things all the time. And I'm like, inside, I'm like, oh man, they have no idea that that has MSG in it. It's like, it's none of my business. Yeah. But if you ask me, hey, what do you think of this thing I'm eating? We're going to sit down for an hour. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So so the, the passion, the authenticity, the having lived that experience, and then also... I think to get through to people is mm, using using empathy to like feel where somebody's wall is. Yeah. So I can I can just feel out if I mention a certain word and you sort of bristle and it's a little too woo woo. Then I just intuitively, innately, very quickly I reel that in and I make it more pragmatic. Yeah. So it's really feeling out for that person's response and also helping people uh, find their bottom. You know, because some of us get into drugs, some of us get into alcohol, some of us get into crazy sex and pornography and prostitution. Some of us are just obsessed with thinking, you know, so it can be the, the, the um, you know, the dis-ease of our lifestyle that's negatively affecting us can manifest in a number of different ways. So it's like a matter of finding someone where they are and someone be like, well, I don't need to be spiritual. I'm not addicted to drugs. I don't smoke cigarettes. It's like, cool. Okay. So we can leave that off the table. You're not, those aren't your escape mechanisms, but can you put your phone down for more than an hour? You know, can you stop yourself from thinking, do you worry? 
can you control your thoughts? No one can control their thoughts. So right there, you've got them. You're powerless. You need help. Yeah. Well, what do you need help with? You need help with, you need power. You need to access energy that can help you self-regulate your emotions and to be able to make peace with the mind because the mind does what the mind does. Mm-hmm. It thinks about shit. I mean, just this morning, I was meditating right there. And my life is pretty smooth right now. I mean, I know it's temporary. There's always a lesson coming. But right now, things are going well. A couple things I got to work on professionally, you know, problems to solve, but no big deal. I'm sitting there, and this happened to me. I had this realization when I went to bed last night that, um, how do I say this without, like, outing anyone? Um, I received some professional services, you know, in the medical field recently. And yesterday I went to kind of as a check-in and I paid to have some work done, you know, and it felt a little, I was like, well, this, I didn't really need this thing that I paid for as it turned out. And I got home and I'm laying in bed and my mind's like, oh, hell no, this is uncool. They're milking me for extra cash. I said, I didn't need this thing. They kind of talked me into it. It was misrepresented. There's a lack of in other words, I perceive there to be a lack of integrity <laughs> on the part of that person or just ignorance. And they're just kind of being sloppy. And yeah, 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 you need this, this, and this. Where's your credit card? Yeah. And I came home and I was like, actually, this isn't what I wanted. And, and another thing I had done wasn't done right. And I mentioned it. They were like, no, 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 you'll get used to it kind of thing. And I was like, oh, okay. And I just wasn't really in my power. And I became a little passive and sort of people please and was just like ah, i don't want to make problems you know and then it hit me as i'm about to go to sleep i was like god damn it there's something in me now that needs to change in other words there's some character development within myself i want to quickly jump in because i know you being here with me now means there's a good chance you want to create more out of your life more freedom more money more success more happiness from what you do And if you're like the other high achievers, you need three things to make that happen. Firstly, acceleration. You need the simple plan, the right plan to take you from where you are now to where you want to go and fast. Secondly, accountability. You need to make sure you're taking the right actions every day. So you need to surround yourself with the right people to do that. And finally, access. Access to me and access to the answers so that you can get the help along the way so you don't get stuck. So to get all of this, we've created The Practice. It's the free group you can join now to get all the episodes, the free success planner, the guides, and to join the community of success achievers. All you need to do is go to chrisdufay.com forward slash free group or click the link in the show notes of the player. Now, I've created this show to go beyond just listening to more stuff and just gathering more information. This is about taking action and that's why I'm inviting you to join us now. So I'm looking forward to seeing you on the inside. That is now imminent because this thing's bothering me. And then I was like, cool, I'll deal with it tomorrow. And then I sat down and meditate and I was really good for like about 15 minutes. I was just settling in and having a very peaceful experience. And then ding, yeah, you got to call that guy. And then I felt this fear. Oh, they're going to think I'm like a sore thumb. And, you know, I don't want to like have that confrontation. I'm like afraid of confrontation and then I'm at war with myself in my mind going yeah but they're screwing you you gotta you know this whole thing and I'm just like there it is so what do you do with that you know you can you can meet someone at that level like how do you solve a problem like that when your mind is starting to chew on something yes. and rob you of the experience of being present I'm sitting there trying to be present and get ready for my day and my mind's like no 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 we got to worry about this other thing yeah well, I'm not dealing with that thing right then, but the mind wants to deal with it right then because yeah. the mind's job is to protect, it thinks its job is to protect me from harm and it perceives that I've been harmed and maybe I have. Yeah. And that needs to be properly addressed, you know? So in helping someone sort of find their bottom or raise the bottom, as I was saying, it's yeah. like, you got to find where someone's neurosis is, like where someone's pain point is, because that's where the motivation comes from for them to become humble enough to pursue spiritual ideas and begin to apply spiritual principles or practices into their life. Yeah. Most human beings don't go to the doctor until they're sick. Yeah, totally. You know, totally most human nice. beings, yeah, don't go talk to the rabbi, the shrink, the whomever until they're in enough pain. So you got to find that pain and bring it to the surface. Someone's like, oh man, I didn't realize I'm screwed up. Yeah. I thought I'm good because I don't have these common pathologies of addictions and mm-hmm. some of those more extreme expressions of 
of coping mechanisms or escape mechanisms. You know, for me, it was super easy because my coping mechanisms were so extreme and so pathological and so chronic and just widespread in my life. And they started to affect everyone else that I cared about and hurt them. And so it's like, you know, it only took me until I was 26 to pull the plug on that shit and get very serious about my commitment to my spiritual evolution. What were those steps? How did those steps evolve the... At 26, breaking away from it. <laughs> it's great. It's a cl- it's classic, dude. You know, I, I love telling the story because it's it sounds it sounds like a movie. I always say like the movie Train Spotting. I don't know if you yeah. saw that movie yeah. where the guy, you know, he'd be sequestered away to kick heroin, and there are all these nightmare scenes. And that's what I used to do. I used to like, I don't know if I paid them, but I'd get one of my drug buddies to essentially like put me up for a few days, yeah. and I was going to kick opiates. Yeah. You know, I was yeah. addicted to heroin. I don't say that as like a badge of honor. I was a dumbass. It's not a great life plan. <laughs> you know, it sounds kind of cool in a rock and roll way, but when you're in it, and it is cool the first few times you do it, once you get past the puking, there's this sweet spot of opiate addiction <laughs> yeah. in the preliminary stages where it's very cocoon like and numbing. And to me, it felt really good. It made all my problems disappear, but that was so short lived and later it became a nightmare. So, I don't know, maybe I'd give a guy like a bag of, I was a drug dealer, I sold weed and stuff. So I'd give a guy some drugs to like put me up and I'd be like, don't let me out. Don't give me access to a car. Don't give me a phone. This is pre-cell phone. And I would go kick because, uh, you you know, the withdrawal period takes like three or four days and you're pretty much incapacitated. You can't really walk or get around once you're in the throes of it. You know, yeah. it's like having uh, it's like having the world's the withdrawal is like having the world's worst flu combined with like the deepest most suicidal depression you've ever had you're just cool. yeah. emotional basket case crying uh, sweating nose running diarrhea throwing up it's just it's like the worst human experience i've ever had is withdrawal but the last and I, but see the thing is you forget when you're an addict you go through that you're like i'm never doing that again and then for me the first time that happened a year it went by and I didn't touch that stuff. You know, it was like, oh my God, I've never gone through that again. And then after a year, you're like, it wasn't that bad. I could probably dabble and so on and so on. And what happens over the course of time is that those incremental breaks in between get shorter and shorter. So this is like the worst place you want to be when you're having this experience. And um, what happened was I, you know, checked myself into my drug buddy's little rehab clinic there. And uh, which just means that not that I was not doing drugs, I was just doing a lot of other drugs that help get you off the main one that, that had me by the balls, you know? And uh, so after three or four days, I start to kind of become conscious where you can sort of see and I just watch movies on the loop. I wish I knew what movies I was watching. Hmm. They are probably, yeah, they would have been like on a VHS, you yeah. know, this is yeah. back in 96, I guess, 97. And uh, so I remember coming to, and I'm on the floor, there was no bed, I had some blankets and a pillow and I'm sleeping on this dirty ass carpet and I'd come to, and I couldn't really get up or move. And there'd be like cockroaches, like, do, 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 just walking by my face. You know, it's like, I didn't even have the energy to like get up and smash. <laughs> yeah, just like, okay, this is what it's come to. I'm 26. This is my life, you know. And, uh, and I had a really sort of profound thing happen that I just, I don't know, it just hit me in a second. I was like, this is it. I'm done. I'm just done. I'm finally done. Oh. So I knew that was coming for a long time. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. Uh, that was kind of the key moment, the pinnacle of it, where I made that decision and, um, and I became humble at that moment, you know, because I was always, I was rock and roll. I played in bands. I was a rebel. Wear a leather jacket. Don't tell me to quit doing drugs. Fuck you. Who are you? I'll do what I want. That was my attitude since I'm six years old, you know, kicked out of so many schools and just, I mean, just so many problems, you know? And so, uh, I don't know, in that moment, I just was like, I can't do this. I need help, you know? And, uh, and I called my mom and she'd been waiting for this call for many, many years and tried to talk me into getting help many times. And I was not having, I said, maybe someday, you know, I appreciate you looking out for me, but I'm having fun. I'm in Hollywood doing my thing. You know, I was, I mean, and it was fun for a few years. I'm hanging out with dudes from Guns N' Roses and doing all kinds of crazy shit. It was amazing. Yeah. I mean, in a sense, yeah. Playing in bands with people that, I used to have their poster on my wall when I was a kid. I mean, you know, it's just, I was living the rock and roll dream, but then it quickly started to become an actual nightmare. And so, so I make the call to her and she's like, cool, done, you know, hang tight. And, uh, 
And then she set up, you know, the intake at this rehab. And next mm-hmm. thing you know, two days later, I'm like, what the hell just happened? I'm, I'm checking myself in rehab, woke up in there. And, um, and really the single most powerful moment or moments in my life happened that day. And that would have been February 15th, 1997. And I, I came to in that place and I, um, I didn't know what to do because I couldn't really get away. And I didn't, you know, I didn't smuggle in any drugs or alcohol because the night before I was very adamant about wanting to get clean. Yeah. And I woke up sort of going like, oh shit, I've done it. You know, it's like, what did I, oh my God, what have I done? I almost really regretted it for a minute. I said, no, no, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And I was like, what, what am I supposed to do? And he, I guess I asked them or I had some idea. And I knew that somehow the solution to what was at that time apparently a physical problem because i can't stop putting these physical chemicals in my physical body i didn't i didn't see the issue as like a spiritual sort of malady uh, at that point or the lack of connection with god which is really at the root of alcoholism and drug addiction as you're you're seeking a spiritual experience but you can't get there without this sort of yeah crutch you know and that's really that's why when you get drunk it feels so good because you your ego dissolves and you become sort of almost your real self. You know, you lose your inhibitions and stuff. And that's the state I was always trying to achieve. But I just knew that I needed to get physically clean. That was like the extent of my goal at the moment. Uh, So what I did is I knew that there was some sort of spiritual framework to this whole thing. And I was open to the idea. I kind of liked the idea of India spirituality and things like that. Not going, I wasn't going to go to church or something, you know, God forbid. But uh, I like the idea of sort of gurus and incense and yoga. And I'd had some, some exposure to that even growing up, which is another story. Um, but what happened was I came to that morning and I started to earnestly pray, like old school, like religious style, on your hands and knees, prayer position, going, God, fucking help me. Yeah. You know, it's like, I don't know what I need, except that I need to have these cravings and this constant nagging burning desire to use drugs and drink alcohol i need that gone or i'm not going to be able to live and i'll tell you what chris in that moment to this moment today it just was poof just gone what changed what changed was something entered into my consciousness into my spirit that gave me access to the power that i was lacking yeah to have license and authority over my own actions and behavior. Was it like your story changed? Or maybe even another term could be beliefs? It was beyond that. It wasn't like, it wasn't beliefs. It was an experience, you know? It was that I suddenly had the power of choice. It's like I had bestowed Uh, power. So like if you have, yeah, if we have like a 450 pound, you know, it looks like you've lifted some weights at the time in your life. Imagine right here we have a bench press with 450 pounds on it and you're under there and that thing's on your fucking neck and you can't do anything and you pray and all of a sudden you're like and you put that shit on the bar. That's what happened. I humbled myself and I allowed the power of spirit to enter my life with no reservations. I wasn't like, I'll do this, God, if. It was like, you take everything, you know? And so the course of the past 21 years has been going deeper into that experience and unpacking what the hell happened to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I'm not exaggerating when I say it was a miracle. Something miraculous happened to me. I'm not the guy that lives. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. The path I was on is the guy who goes to prison, yeah. the guy who wrecks a car, the guy who runs someone over and gets a manslaughter conviction. I'm the guy that ODs in a bathroom in a club in Hollywood because I shoot up some weird shit. Like, I'm that guy, and I've watched them drop like flies in the 21 years that I've been living the dream, you know? <laughs> okay, so from that moment, having that experience, do you anchor back to that point now moving forwards, knowing that you can do those things? I do. Yeah. I do. That's how I overcome all of my yeah. problems. Yeah. yeah, break up, I think back, okay, what do I do? Oh, I've forgotten about yeah. God or spirit. You know, I just use the word God. It freaks people out. I just, yeah, no, no, I totally agree. I, I use up so much energy trying to come up with the 15 other terms. And it's just like, I, whatever that means to you, you know how I explain it's like this. It's like, if, even if someone doesn't believe in God, and it's, it goes back to your earlier question, like how do you break through and like yeah. help someone have a spiritual experience that is closed off to that idea? It's like, dude, when you lay down at night and go to sleep, 
what's pushing oxygen into your lungs? What's making your heart beat? What's, where is the electricity that's running your body come from? Yeah. Out of thin air? Yeah. You know, all of the probably hundreds of thousands of biomechanical and biological uh, um, occurrences that are going on in any, any given moment, just in the physical body. When I'm just talking about one body, one person, like what makes your heart beat? Right now, as you and I sit here, what animates life? Are you? I look at a dog. I was just at our office at School of Style, and my partner Lauren is this cute little dog, and Yoji, my favorite creature in the world, little bastard. And because uh, he is, he's like such a little punk, but I just can't stop loving him. But I look at him, and I go, that's so weird. I just look at him sometimes and go, he's like a little robot. Like, what is making him walk around and bark and eat stuff? And it's like, how do you take a little lump of flesh and turn it into a moving, living, breathing yeah. thing? There's a curiosity. Then I call that God. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but it cares about us. It's available to us. It's never gone. It's everywhere. It's at all times. You know, there's words they use in spirituality, like or in religion, you know, omniscience, uh, omnipresent, uh, all powerful, all loving. And those words sound like, yeah, 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 to the rational mind. It's like, well, that would be nice if it was true. But I really believe that that's true, not from an intellectual belief system, but that's my experience. So when and how did you get to start to understand, and I'll use the word metaphysical? I think that's just one of those words that I've adopted to avoid saying the word God. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Metaphysical, it's like under, I think it means under, or I don't know, maybe, you beyond. know, uh, beyond, beyond, maybe, yeah. okay, beyond the yeah. physical. So it's like, the physical has relevance and all of the health stuff I'm into and all that. It's valid, man, because your operating system has got to be optimized. Yes. You know, I mean, I really believe in, you know, you're obviously fit. You look like you get some sun. Like last night I went to bed really late and I woke up this morning and I was way less spiritually tuned in yeah. and probably more susceptible to that kind of resentment yeah, yeah, yeah. issue. Yeah, totally, yeah. Just because my mitochondria are not <laughs> firing up like I would like them to be. So I'm, I'm weaker. I have less energy. So the physical is important, but... The beyond physical is like keeping an awareness and an acknowledgement of the fact, not the theory, but the fact, even scientifically. I mean, ask Einstein, you know, is that there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye, you know, and that our senses are so limited in what we're able to perceive. And the senses that we have immediate access to are really just sort of indicators of where we are in space and time and our surroundings and how safe we are physically. So if you smell fire, that's an indicator. we got to get the fuck out of here. If you smell fear, if you smell aggression, if you see someone's body language appear like they're about to attack, et cetera, et cetera. You see a mate that looks, you know, mm -hmm. attractive for some, um, some um, procreation, whatever the case may be, smelling food, you know, to see if it's gone bad. You know, all that kind of stuff is the physical. But to me, the physical experience in this body on the earth plane serves one purpose and one purpose only. And that's to give embodiment to my metaphysical or higher or spiritual self in order to come here and interact with the 3D world to use it as a school yep. for the soul. Yep. So this is soul school. But because our senses are so powerfully overwhelming to us that it tricks us into thinking that this is what it is and this is what it's about this and this is, is all there is. is. So the metaphysical is an awareness that cool. You and I are here. You're in a black shirt. I'm in a gray jacket or a brown jacket. There's cameras there. We're in an apartment in Los Angeles, California. But no, that's not really what's happening. Yeah. What's happening is you came here for the mission to talk to me, and I'm here for the mission to talk to you, and we're here for the mission to share a soul, yeah. heart, love experience with one another yeah. and for the people listening and watching so that they might go, oh, yeah, there's more to me than my problems and my bank account and the divorce and you know, the 10 pounds that I need to lose and the career that I don't enjoy anymore and the kid that, you know, um, ran away or, you know, whatever the melodrama of the human experience is, that there's, there's something above and beyond that. And for me, that framework gives life meaning, gives life, life purpose, and it also helps me when I'm in the middle of the eye of the storm, of the hurricane that is bound to come, as I said earlier. Right now, things are relatively smooth. Give it a month, you know? She's coming. I'll be in a new relationship and freaking out about it or what, you know, whatever. She's pregnant. Fuck. You know, it's like, who knows? Yeah. I got a house. Can I afford it? You know, quality problems even create stress. Yeah. You know, expansion creates stress and expansion is what it's all about. But even in those moments of expansion and contraction, 
I know that there's, I just know it's not a theory. It's not an idea. It's not something I read in a book. I know exactly why I'm here. I know the purpose of my life. And that is very meaningful. That's very powerful. Oh, okay. Now, life stylists, lifestyle design, when it comes to these terms and what it is that you do with your clients, I don't like the word, especially for you coaching. Yeah. Clients, do you know what I mean? Yeah. People well, you know what's funny about the coaching thing is like I made a big effort. I put it all over my website and I have this application people have to fill out and then I probably have like, I don't know, 15 applications in there right now. I can't even, I don't even answer them because like I'm just so busy creating content and doing other stuff. I sort of don't get to that part of it, you know? Yeah. So it's, I keep saying that I do that. People that have filled out the application are like, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> it fucking doesn't respond. Yeah. I just, I don't know. It's, I, I'm struggling with time management a little, but anyway, yeah, that, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also like in terms of a business plan, which is weird to kind of conceptualize it all, but I knew that that was sort of a stop along the way. And that that's, it's not my mission to like work with one person at a time forever. It was maybe phase two of my kind of model for growth and stuff. So anyway, where do you feel like you help people? Why lifestyle this? Why lifestyle this? Well, here's the thing, because There are truths, a.k.a. principles, of the known physical universe, right? They're just things that are true, like clean spring water right out of a mountain is going to give you much more life force energy than water out of an L.A. tap. So that's a truth. It's a universal truth. You can't change that. You can't refute it, okay? There's basic truths. There's basic truths that things like MSG and aspartame are neurotoxins and they destroy your mind and your body and they're going to make you sick and get diseases. So there's just very fundamental principles. It's important to move your body, that you're mobile. Um, all of that, those are truths. And then there's the metaphysical truths that meditation over time, for example, just as one of the thousands of practices you could integrate into your lifestyle, that different forms of meditation do different things. But one that I practice in particular over time gives you a sense of a gap of separation between who you really are as spirit Mm -hmm. and the busyness of the mind and the impulses of the instincts and the ego and the emotions. And so it's funny you say that because a lot of the time when I meditate, actually my, I start with that visualization of actually pulling myself back where I'm more sitting from here, actually trying to look at myself to try and create that gap. As you just said, that's cool. Like zooming out almost. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, lifestyle design is about, and this is what my show is about, why I called it the lifestyle. It's about researching and um, identifying what the most powerful and practical truths or principles Mm -hmm. in the physical and metaphysical are and how to integrate them into your life so that they become automated and habitual. So it just becomes part of who you are, not what you do. So it's just like, I wouldn't even think of not meditating. It's like, not meditate? Who would, uh, why would you ever not meditate? You know, but it wasn't always that way. In the beginning, it was like, oh shit, I should probably be meditating. And I tried for a few years and it was spotty. And then eventually I found, to me, at least for my makeup, the type of meditation. I do Vedic meditation. And I could change maybe in a year, I find some other thing and I abandon Vedic and I move on. You know, there's, it's all, um, each teacher or teaching or, or principle that you find um, might only serve you for a certain period. You know, it doesn't mean that it's invalid. It just means that it's valid at a certain stage of your evolution and growth. And then at a higher or maybe even just a different level of evolution or growth, then you might uh, be able to use another tool in your arsenal. You know, yeah. so it's like finding for me, just finding the best of the best, even if that's just the best possible B vitamin. Yeah, which sounds simple, but there's thousands yeah. on Amazon, and I like right now I do one from um, Quicksilver Scientific. If anyone wants to check it out, it's a um, liposomal delivery. You take yeah. it sublingually under your tongue, and it's it's insanely powerful. I mean, instantaneous. Like, whoa, wow, what was that? And that's after years of there's probably been in hundreds, if not a couple thousand dollars on B vitamins. Yeah. You know, that's just one 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 tenth of a percent of the lifestyle that I'm designing and helping other people to discover. So whether it be like the dopest B vitamin or, you know, the best um, therapist to teach you how to communicate in the Imago model in your relationship. Like I probably know the best person or one of the best. I'm going to find them, interview them, get to know them. Yeah. And they're going to be my recommendation until I find someone that I think is um, 
got it uh, on uh, more of a lock than they do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's it's like this that's in it relates right back, kind of creates a nice uh, puts a nice bow on the beginning of the conversation. It's the same thing I did when I was a fashion stylist. I know if I go to Barney's that they have, you know, the best um, collection of Rick Owens. And if I go to um, Saks, they have the best women's shoes. And I go to American Rag on the Brea, they have the best denim bar. It's like you go around town and you find the best of the best. This store has the jewelry. These there's I know the best hat maker. He's all the way out in the valley. You know, I know this place in New York or Paris where I can order shit. FedEx is going to get here in time. And, you know, you put together the goods and then you create something out of all of these sort of separate parts. And I look at a lifestyle and the architecture of building a lifestyle is the same way. So you look around my apartment. I mean, we could spend the next three days just trying all of the different supplements and gadgets and all that shit. And that's not going to give you enlightenment, but it will upgrade your biology to the point where you have enough energy perhaps to really go do some deep therapeutic work or um, to really, you know, have a mind that is clean and energy energized enough where you can meditate or if you want to sit down and do 20 minutes of really intensive breath work, like you've got the energy to do that. Mm. So yeah, it's like finding, I think I just want to find the truth. Like the, the unadulterated absolute truth of these different practices and experts and bring them all together and create an amalgam complete whole out of them that I can kind of hand to someone. Yes. No, okay. I really like that because I think especially when it comes to the word biohacking and optimizing and all these things, there's a lot of misinformation or just too much information and too much confusion when it comes to that as well. How do you help people understand what tools for what job and really how to place themselves or even navigate the seats through it. Oh, that's so good. And I think that's something that I'm, I'm really good at and something that I really enjoy because I've been doing this stuff for so long that I've sort of gone down all of the dead ends, you know, yeah. like I was a vegetarian. And for me, that ended up being the dead end. I did it 10 years. I mean, I gave it a, you get through a college shelf. try, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, to me, there was limitations to that approach to eating. And I hit the wall with that eventually. I was like, wow, I need a different approach. So um, it's like, I just feel like I've tried everything. And so I can tell like what's going to move the needle fast. In fact, my friend David that was here earlier, he was like, hey, I have to talk to this doctor. He wants 14 grand. He's going to run me through this year long program. I'm like, bro, yeah. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But he was asking my advice. And I said, if it was me, I'd take three grand, buy a sauna, call this other guy, 500 bucks. He's going to set you up with this other detox. That, you know, I had a whole plan in my head and we could sit down for half an hour and I could write him a sort of a model of yeah. healing for the next year for half that money, you know? So what I recommend to people is you got to look at what the biggest block is spiritually, psychologically, mentally, or physically that you're dealing with right now. And that's the thing you go for just to clear the path a little bit, but I'm like, where, where are you on the totem pole? It's not the yeah. Time. Yeah. And then, and then also where I've gotten to with all this stuff, having wasted probably a lot, not probably definitely a lot of time and energy over the years, kind of chasing my tail is you see a function, like physically, you see a functional medicine doctor, you get all your labs done and you start working on the root causes. Yeah. Like don't guess, don't go buy these thousand dollar weird devices that I I'm into or all the supplements. I mean, there was a time, dude, where I finally like looked at my budget mm. and I was like, hmm. I'm spending $3,000 a month on supplements. Yeah. That's not including food. Yeah. That's not including, you know, medical care. That's just shit. I go buy at the health food store or on Amazon and yeah. stock my cabinet with. And it's like, I could have taken one of those months of $3,000 run extensive labs and seem like I don't need to be taking vitamin D. Mm. Okay, that just saved me $30 a month. Um, I'm actually fine in B vitamins, magnesium, whatever. However, my like what I found out last year doing this, and I speak from experience, is my gut was full of um, parasites and I had E. coli and all this stuff. I just got done with the cleanse. I feel so good. Yeah. But I could have been, oh, I have no energy, man. Wow, I need to take something that gives me energy. Yeah. No, that's not the problem. The problem is there's some creatures inside me sapping me of energy. So my approach is like going to the root problem and... In something like a psychological or more spiritual issue, well, let's look at the root of that. And, you know, I'm not, I'm more into the spiritual than the therapeutic model personally, because I just believe in that power that it can really move. But there is a lot to be said with going back and like really taking a look at and owning uh, trauma and things like that that we've experienced and doing it with someone who is 
apt at taking you there in a way that's safe. There's not going to end you up in a mental hospital or the suicide ward. Or the work they're doing with maps at the moment. What's that? The work they're doing with maps at the moment. Yeah. And psilocybin and yeah. therapy. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So, you know, I think it, um, it depends on the person and where they are and how much work they've already done. Some people are just ground zero and they're yeah. still eating McDonald's. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, they still resent their parents and shit. Whoa, whoa. We got to like back way, way up. Yeah. You know, but if you have someone who's been living a healthy lifestyle and they're just stuck with finances or relationships or however their, you know, their past um, trauma has manifested in patterns in their life and they can't break out of repeating those patterns. I've had a lot of really destructive negative patterns in my life and I've had to look, well, first, where did that pattern come from? Yep. And what are the mechanisms of action to undo and actually arrest that pattern so that I can kind of poke my head in the window of a new house and eventually move in there where the old house is no longer inhabited by me. It's still there and I might move back in every once in a while for a couple yeah, days, but yeah. I'm living in a new paradigm. I really like that. I think that's such an important message for people to understand because everybody can hear about the, the fandangle stuff, the super high tech, the super expensive, like all this stuff. But if they're in McDonald's, do you know what I mean? And they've got resentment against their parents, as you said, like, let's just take one little step right now. Yeah. How do you help people take that little step? Well, It depends what, what the first step is, you know? It's like... Actually, you know what? Let me reframe that. Yeah. Shit question. Let me come back with a better one. That's How okay. do you help people have consciousness to what's going on? Last question. I think that... You know, I think that people... It's okay. It's it's divorce. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> We're massively behind time. <laughs> I was listening. We were just looking at the clock. I have my network spinal analysis. Luckily, I think it's like a, it, they're a little bit flexible because it's a group of people and stuff like that. So I'll be respectful of them. And also, I'm excited. Like, I'm, I can talk... I can, dude, I literally can talk about this stuff for the next eight hours without even stopping to go to the bathroom, probably. Um, so give me the question. I'll come back to it another time. Yeah, yeah. What's the one thing you want the people watching and listening right now to do from today? I would say probably the one most meaningful thing. I mean, the health and all that stuff is important, but you can figure that out anywhere. I think for me, as I go through my life on a day-to-day -day basis, the number one most important thing for me is to keep some small part of my awareness on the element of life and of my existence that is not this physical body, yep. that is not the physical surroundings that I'm sitting in, yep. sitting on. Uh, it's not my emotions, the feelings that come up, the different sensations of mind and body. And it's not the thoughts. There is something beyond all of that. And if I can just sort of keep, you know, one little finger in touch with that, or I, I kind of look at it like, you know, the, the, you're at a swimming pool, right? And in that swimming pool is like all spiritual truth and God and everything's in there. But you still have to walk around the edge of the pool to like eat a sandwich and get laid and do shit, make money. You know, it's like you got to live in the real world. But I always keep one toe in the water. You know, it's like I'm staying in touch with that. So as you and I, and you could even say it like this, so as you and I have this conversation, like I'm very much present. I'm with you. We're, we're having this connection. I also am aware. We're also, that, yeah, yeah, and, too I'm, much. and I'm aware that the yeah. clock's here. I'm aware that the light is over there and the cameras are there. And it's the same way with God or spirit or or that unseen hand, I like to call it, which is a, a hand of kindness, not a backhand. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't believe in a punishing God, but as I go through my life, I just I really have built the practice of staying aware that there's more going on than is just apparent in that sort of survival mode that I can sometimes get yeah. into. And if we can just keep our toe in the water and know that that there is a loving, benevolent, creative force at work at all times in the universe and that it's open to us at any moment. And in fact, it's not that it ever leaves us, it's that we leave it. Yeah. Because it's the experience of it gets obscured by the day-to-day -day human experience of walking around the pool. You yeah. stub your toe, oh shit. No, oh, there's no God. No, God's still there. You just stub your toe and you're yeah. pissed off. Yeah. But you did it to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah totally. You know what I mean? So good. Okay, this has been fantastic. Now... I highly recommend that you. I feel like we've just scratched the surface right now. Like I do, really, me too. This has been really good. So <laughs> do make sure that you're going to go tune into Luke's podcast. I'll pop all the links below so you can get onto his show. You can subscribe on iTunes to his podcast as well. Where else should they go to find out more? 
The Lifestylist podcast is kind of the mothership uh, of content. That's where I do the stuff that I enjoy the best. Uh, but I have a site called LukeStory.com with a story with an EY and, um, you know, all video content and podcasts and podcasts like yours that I've been a guest on. All that stuff kind of lives there. Awesome. And I think on social, Instagram, at LukeStory is probably the most interesting follow because I do a lot of things, especially in Instagram stories that I would never do anywhere else because <laughs> yeah. I know they're going to disappear. So... Like the most real, authentic, unretouched version of myself is kind of on there. And I actually, it's probably dumb marketing wise, but I provide a lot of value on my Instagram stories, like a lot of lessons and how to's and stuff. And my friends are always like, dude, you're giving like really good content. And then it just disappears yeah. into the ether. And I'm like, I don't know. It's fun. I kind of like that it goes away and I have to do it over again and present the same ideas in a different way. Yes. You know? so, yes. yeah, so that's, that's kind of mostly where I am. Yeah. Awesome. So do make sure that you get a part of everything Luke's doing. I want to say a huge thank you to Melissa and Rossini because when I came here to LA, I had some very fine time. I was like, who's the one person that I should go and see? And she recommended you. That's awesome. Fantastic. So, cool, man. Thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you, it. Thank you, man.